Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Chris Metzler, Director of Programming here at the Green Film Festival of San Francisco, presented by SFND Fest. Um, as you can see with, with us, these kind of virtual Q and A's that we're doing, we're still kind of living in that kind of weird world of the pandemic. Uh, but there's a lot of cool, creative filmmakers still making films and getting them out in the world. And so we were really excited just to share this wonderful documentary, Force for the Trees. And um, we have some of the, the team here. Uh, can you each introduce yourself? Well, I'm Rita Leisner. I'm the uh, producer, director, and director of photography yeah, for us for the trees. I'm Darby McInnes. I uh, I edited the film. And I'm Megan O'Brien, and I'm a tree planter. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, being here, guys. Um, maybe a good place to kind of start is, um, you know, Rita, how did you kind of first hear... Um, about this kind of story and knew that you kind of wanted to go down this rabbit hole of making a documentary? Well, I was a tree planter uh, for 10 years from 1984 to 1992. And I think back, even back then, I thought about making a documentary film about tree planting like many tree planters do. But at that time I knew zero about, about filmmaking. So it took it. It's taken 26 years to get to today from my last tree that I planted. And did you uh, did you see that evolve over time, or was it you know you know is the pro is it the folks that are still kind of you know drawn to it, or is it kind of universal in the sense of your kind of same cohorts um, you know from the 80s or you know mm. as it's you know well, stay the same, or how has it evolved? Do you think? Well, I think the the demographic has changed has changed because I was part of the tail end of the very first generation of tree planters, so it was very few, very much fewer people, many fewer people then, um, and so I think there. Well, for one thing, there are more women, um, and the diversity is increasing slowly over time. But you have to know someone who plants trees really to even know it exists. So that's why it's sort of it starts kind of in the family and, oh, interesting. Uh, and grows from that. Mm -hmm. And Megan, you know, when um, when Rita was kind of you know making this documentary, like uh, were you comfortable with like uh, you know, kind of sharing your story? Like what was that kind of process like of like you know, finding out who you wanted to kind of uh, follow Rita and was there kind of a collaboration? How did the story evolve? Of, evolve yeah so um rita worked on it i mean for more than four years but really the filming uh takes place over four years um but rita really came to us as like an equal really we felt this it's this immediate kind of kinship where she's been through what we are going through so right away it felt very natural to talk to her she um was just very open you know really let us tell our stories and just really volleys back and forth with that and then all the footage of her um like of people planting and things it's like you know she wasn't even there right she just moves along with you so quick she still got her you know her bush um capabilities so mm -hmm. it just felt like a really natural thing um and she was just she was there for it. She was experiencing everything with us, you know? So it's like talking to a friend, another planter. So I think she got a lot of really genuine answers and a really intimate look. And how did the kind of like, um, for lack of a better way, like the organizational process work? I'm just thinking of like over the course of four years, where there kind of certain seasons where you're like, okay, I know this is when I want to kind of film or how did you kind of like, decide when you wanted to kind of drop in and tell it or was the editorial process going on all at the same time or um, were you getting like enough footage to kind of bring back and figure out yeah what how did that all work out the editing came in very near the end um, because you know I come from a photojournalism tradition so I really go in without having a preconceived idea of the story like I have a general framework and ideas of what I want to capture emotionally but uh I just, I thought, okay, I'm going to start this and I don't know where it's going to go. So 
you know, the first year I went out, I had no, I, I had no plans of it taking four years. I mean, in fact, after the third year, they threw a goodbye party for me in the bush and on the way <laughs> out of the bush, I turned and said to Liam Maloney, my buddy who came out and helped with some of the filming, oh shit, I think I have to go back next year. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's seasonal work. So I, it starts earlier on the coast because of the climate, but you know, uh, just do north of where you guys are in San Francisco. But um, I was focusing on the interior BC. The season really starts about now, end of uh, end of uh, May or end of March. Sorry, end of March. So it had to be March, really, to August. That was the you know the climate depend uh, rule gov directed that for me, and then I tried to stay out kind of as much as I could. I came back, flew back to Toronto a couple of times to meet with my printer because, of course, I'm making these giant stills photographs as I'm going, and I need to make sure everything's working. So I needed to do test prints. I needed a bit of a break as well. So uh -huh. I fly back to Toronto for like a week and then and then come back. Initially, I had to drive out because I had so much gear, so I had to drive it all out. And then the second year, I bought a trailer and I drove that out. But uh, and then I just kept going until I had what I needed. Darby had edited the short film I made in 2013. He was always my first pick for an editor, but he wasn't, he wasn't around. I mean, I, we have limited time, but, but I knew that Darby had moved to New York and then, but his name, people kept saying, ask Darby. I'm like, well, Darby lives in New York. <laughs> Darby lives in New York. And finally I just called him and this was uh, halfway through the last of the four years of shooting. Okay, so we got all the way to this point. I'd been logging, that had been about the maximum. I've been logging footage myself and organizing it by theme. I mean, there's a lot of obviously visual footage that I was going after as well as, you know, 125 interviews, 400 hours of, of film footage. And, uh, and I called him, he's like, well, okay. There's one condition though. I've, I've fallen in love with a woman in Brooklyn and uh, I'm in Toronto and if I don't go there soon, she's not going to think I'm serious. So I'll edit your film on condition that we do it in New York. And I've lived in New York for seven years in the past. Love New York. It's obviously a huge photography town. I have a lot of connections. So I was like, it's done. And so <laughs> I packed all my crap up. I rented a place in uh, on Mott Street right in uh, NoHo. And, and we edited more than half the film in New York. And we started in july was it and i was supposed to be done like that was another time i was supposed to be done shooting and we're in this like the little studio and on mott street and i said to darby i i gotta go back <laughs> and i had already brought my trailer back so i flew i like shipped out by playing tons of gear and i went out for three more weeks and you know that's where we got the footage of stephanie uh anyways it was it was worth going back for yeah, that's sort of the schedule. And then it took, we edited in New York for what, six months, Darby? Yeah, we came back for Christmas, I want to say. And then we were cutting in Toronto and then lock, yeah. Then everything went into lockdown. We COVID hit while we were just finishing. We had one week left, I think, and then COVID hit. So it, well, it gave us a bit more time, right? So then we, yeah. we edited for at least 10 months by the end of it, 10, 11 months. Yeah, and probably. Then, and yeah. then 12 months, maybe, and then three more months for sound and score. All And then that was all done through Zoom. Well, it, it kind of raises two questions I'm curious about. So one, Darby, is like, you know, as Rita kind of been, um, you know, developing this film, you know, when you kind of dug in, did you kind of feel like you were traveling through time and kind of seeing her experience? Like, what was the kind of, how did you kind of, how did you kind of first dig in and like start kind of, pulling together the story did you watch everything or you worked through the logs or like what was um yeah so I actually Rita first got in touch with me she was saying like oh I have this photography project I want to do uh there's this tree planning company and I I known tree planners when I was in uh university I knew wow. I knew when I was an undergrad I knew I knew people who were tree planters but Rita was just saying she goes oh they they um I just want to be able to show them uh, this, this stuff I'm doing just, you know, cause I'm thinking of shooting something. It was, it was very early on. And so I just helped her put together something very, very 
basic. And then she went and I, I didn't hear back for a few years, but I knew, I knew other people, mm-hmm. other people had said like, oh yeah, Rita's working on this tree planter film. And then, that. yeah. And then, and then, yeah, she got back in touch with me. Is, I don't even remember Rita. When was it? 20, I guess it would have been 2018. 2019. 2019. Yeah. And then, yeah, we set and it up. It but I, really quickly. Then it started to happen because I, that was like really needed. Yeah. It started to yeah. But I knew of tree planting and I knew some people had done it and I knew it was, I mean, I just knew it was hard work. People go out into the bush and they get paid per tree. And that was, and like the people who do it are kind of hardcore. And that, that was all I knew. I was all I knew going in, but then Rita came back with, yeah, just troves and troves of like, yeah, drone footage, photographs, interviews with people who were planting and just, yeah. And it, it was just a matter of, um, I think we did it mostly chronological. Like, I think I started with some of the earliest stuff or, and Rita had flagged some of the subjects, like some of the interviews. We probably started with that, of just going through. Cause like, that was always the most interesting thing was that, was, you know, the, the people who do it sort of was, was sort of the easy entry way into um, starting the story. I thought it turned out really well. And I mean, uh, you know, Megan, do you, like, you know. Uh, can, I just say, can I say something? Uh-huh, yeah, absolutely. I could interrupt. So. I remember Darby would describe it as the low hanging fruit. And cause we have these, you know, over a hundred interviews and I like flagged a couple of them. And then he, you know, he watched all the footage that three weeks I went back. And so there we had a list of like interviews we, we felt was the low hanging fruit. And so Darby, um, you know, for most of the interviews, like he, he wasn't going from any kind of script that I gave him. He had the interview and maybe it was an hour long and he would just sit there with his headphones on and he just clips it by listening and watching, you know, without using notes. It's amazing, actually. And then he'll say, like, I'll have something for you by the end of Saturday. And then he'd leave and he'd upload it and then he'd be gone. And I'd usually wait till the next day and I'd get my coffee and I'd watch it. And I'd see this incredible, you know, like a first pass, but very close to done. So amazingly of of a portrait. And I remember when he did Megan and I have to say, like, I'm kind of blown away because we had a lot of conversations about how for editors, you get to meet these people and they don't know you at all, but you've spent all this time with them. And, and I have to say, Megan, Darby, like always loved you so much. He was just like, oh my God, she's amazing. I love her so much. And so I can't, like, uh, that's why I really wanted you both to be in this interview. <laughs> he loves everybody, but it was something kind of miraculous. So that. Darn, so you, both of you. No, <laughs> it's it, you know it's. I think this is the thing that's really great for audiences to see is just like you know, you know, so often you know with a documentary, it's like we've seen, um, you know, we see what you've all collaborated with, you know, putting together on screen. It's kind of neat to kind of see these interactions and like, you know, uh, you know, no different sides of the people, uh, you know, behind the work. And um, before I forget, I was going to ask you, Megan, it's like you know. Um, we kind of are familiar with how the last two years of the pandemic has affected like film production and filmmaking and film festivals, but like, you know, were there, you know, impacts on tree planting because of the pandemic or did basically things just continue as they have um, always? Yeah. So I think it was definitely because it came really lockdown started in March. So there was a lot up in the air as to some people didn't go back. Um, I didn't go back actually for the 2020 season, um, but a lot of my friends did go back. So they had, um, because you work in crews when you tree plant of either 12 or six people. So they had um, a designated person at camp to do uh, cleaning while everyone was away, disinfecting everything. um, And people would eat in shifts. So you would kind of eat with your crew and then disperse and um, you would wear masks on the way to the block. Um, And then also people weren't allowed really to go into town. So on your day off, usually you go into town, you go to the rec center, you sit in the hot tub for a few hours, you do your laundry, you eat some food and everything and connect with the real world. Um, But that was kind of uh, people experienced a new level of isolation. but I think slowly we're coming back to it being more open. 
again. So not eating in shifts, having that kind of bigger sense of community within your camps. And then, I mean, hopefully getting to hit those hot tubs again too. But, uh, <laughs> Definitely, I think the first season during COVID was was a bit strange and a bit jarring for everyone. And, you know, uh, I know that there's probably some folks that are going to see this film and say, you know, hey, you know, I might want to do this, you know. And, you know, Rita had mentioned that, you know, so much of this is word of mouth and things. And so for those of you that, like, maybe have an inkling of it, it's like, you know, is there a type of person that this kind of life is best for? or um, what uh, what would be the next steps if they wanted to kind of explore that? So one of the things I love most about tree planting is that you will never meet uh, the same person twice. Every single person is coming from a different, completely different walk of life than you. So, um, so it, it really is, tree planting isn't really for one type of person. You just have to want it. You know, you have to want it really bad, whether that's um, money, or if it's trying to prove to yourself how, what your limits are, like, there are some amazing people, and there are some really weird people who get into <laughs> tree planting, so um, it's just, it's amazing, the array of people, so, I mean, if anyone's thinking about tree planting, I can't recommend it enough, but um, you'll, you'll face, you know, some of uh, your hardest limits, but you'll have a life-changing experience. Well said. And you know, thank you for doing what you do. And um, obviously, uh, you know, Rita and Darby, you know, thanks for making this film. Um, the thing I always try to encourage like film festival audiences is like we're lucky enough to have um, you know, filmmakers share their films at this stage, you know, with us. And so with it, you know, we're kind of the street team to kind of help kind of spread the word. And so, Rita, what's the next steps with the film and how can we kind of continue to follow its path or just even you know, kind of spread the word that we saw this really rad movie. Okay, well, <clears throat> quick shout out to Coast Range Contracting, and that's the company owned by my old tree planting buddy where the whole film was made. So if you're looking for a tree planting jobs, start there. You can just Google it, Coast Range Contracting, and say that uh, Rita sent you. Um, <laughs> so I have a website. You can easily get to it at fftt.earth, forestforthetrees.earth. And on that website are listed places the film screening, but also really importantly for me, um, I have a really beautiful photography book. Um, I should have it ready. And uh, it's basically like the analog, if you thought this film was beautiful, you can own like an analog version of this for, it's like 50 US dollars. It's really reasonable. And if you go to fftt.earth, or you go to DowieLewis.com USA, that's the publisher. Uh, it ships anywhere in the US for six bucks. It is by all accounts stunning and beautiful and all the people in the film or many of the people in the film are here. Um, so that's, <laughs> that's a way of supporting me and the film because to me, they're, they're a collective. It's a really unique thing. How many people have both? I also have giant fine art photographs that I try and sell, and that's actually how I make my money. So for that, you could go to the Stephen Bulger Gallery. Um, yeah, that's how I'm trying to get the word out. Um, yeah. Very cool. Well, folks, uh, please, uh, please kind of check out and, you know, see, um, you know, these different kind of different kind of artistic interpretations of the story that Reed has created that are just uh, really special. I know I'll be heading over there. Um, and you know, thank you for sharing this story. Earth. FFT, uh, oh, so what is <laughs> it again? Forest for the trees. FFTT. FFTT dot Earth. Well, thanks again for joining us and thanks again for being part of the festival. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.